Hello, I'm Lexi, and this is What You Should Know. I am back. Did you miss me? Because I definitely missed you all so much. They say the three most stressful things you can do in your life is move house, get married, and change jobs. And I did all of that in April. But that is okay. I had my husband by my side as we moved states, and it has been a blast. Stressful, but a blast nonetheless. I won't dally too much because I imagine you are just itching to get into it. And so am I. So we are back in the 1800s with a requested case. Thank you so much for the suggestion, Lyndall. It took me a hot minute, but I found the information on 19th century baby farming in Australia. I do give a decent heads up. This episode contains distressing and disturbing content. And if that isn't for you, that is fine. Otherwise, strap in. This is what you should know about the crimes of Sarah and John Menken. Now there may be a few of you who already know what baby farming is, but for those of us who have absolutely no idea or may mistake it for a cute 1980s term of buying a Cabbage Patch Kid, let me explain. Baby farming, as it was known in a more insulting manner, was the historical practice of someone accepting custody of an infant or child in exchange for money in late Victorian times. This would vary from periodical payments to care for the child and all the way through to accepting large lump sums to adopt permanently. This is fairly like the idea of being a foster parent in today's society. However, Reasons from the 1800s would differ vastly to why someone would have a child in care nowadays. There would be wealthier families who would send infants to live with a wet nurse until the child was a toddler. Other situations would include young women falling pregnant unexpectedly and rather than live with the horrifying shame of being an unwed mother with no status in the 1800s, they would give birth in secret and then send the child away. For the baby farmers, they would adopt a baby for a lump sum. Horrifyingly, it was more profitable for the baby farmer if the infant or child they adopted died, since the small payment could not cover the care of the child for long. This would lead to these defenseless children being abused, neglected, or sometimes outright murdered. Which really isn't too different from some of the rare horror stories you hear of children in foster care today. But now you have an understanding on the idea of what this episode is about, I'll give you one last warning that this is the point of no return. If this is not something you feel you can listen to, click off. I promise I won't be offended. This is a very touchy subject for sure. Let's start with who Sarah Menken is. Born Sarah Sutcliffe on the 20th of December, 1845 in Sydney, Australia, she was the only daughter of Emmanuel Sutcliffe, a convict from York. Now, this was the 1800s. His conviction was for the theft of fabric and being connected to a bad gang. And his punishment would be seven years of hard labour in Australia. Emmanuel would be lazy, surly and rebellious against the colonial guardsmen who would do their best to keep the convicts in line. Sarah's mother, Ellen Murphy, would almost be the polar opposite of Emmanuel, moving to Australia as a free settler on the 4th of April 1843. Ellen's initial worries of arriving in Australia and hoping to find herself a job with current skills as a straw hat maker and servant were soon replaced with safety as she was greeted at the dock by hordes of men, catcalling, yelling obscenities and the occasional proposal of marriage. There is a chance that Ellen may have met Emmanuel that day on the dock, but it has never been confirmed in records. However, it is confirmed that they did marry roughly a year later and would move to Palmyra, Sydney, on the 26th of October, 1844. Sydney living would only last for 14 months, and eventually, in 1846, the Sutcliffe family moved to Camden Town, where Ellen would give birth to her second child, George, on the 26th of October, 1847. Suffice to say, Sarah's childhood would have been typical for the time, likely living in rural outposts as the country expanded and built on more of the stolen land. But this wouldn't stay peaceful and progressive for its time, as on the 22nd of December, 1857, George Sutcliffe, the only son of Ellen and Emmanuel, and younger brother of Sarah, tragically drowned at the age of nine. 
It is theorised that this would have been the turning point for Sarah. Was she tasked with watching her younger brother? Did Emmanuel take out his grief on his remaining child? We don't entirely know. What we do know is that later in life, Sarah was known for her own violence and short temper. It is strongly believed that this disposition was inherited from her father, who was still bitter about his time as a convict. But was this learned behaviour or reactive behaviour from having to face the brunt of it? By the 1860s, the Sutcliffe family had moved back to Sydney for reasons unknown, and at the age of 19, Sarah moved away from her parents and married a man by the name of Charles Edwards on the 29th of April, 1865. From this marriage, only one child would be born, a girl named Minnie Josephine, either in 1866 or 1867. However, her birth was not registered, which is why we can't pinpoint what year exactly she was born. Due to the time, not a lot is known about Sarah's first husband. To compact that, there were two Charles Edwards in the area with the same job title of Mariner. The only thing that can be confirmed is that when Sarah's daughter Minnie eventually married, Charles was dead. We then have the second half of this deadly duo, John Mencken, who was born on the 14th of February 1845 in Dapto, New South Wales, to William Menko and Ellen Bolton. He was the fourth of 11 children. A lot isn't clearly known of John's father, William, as there were two by the name that arrived in Australia at roughly the same time as convicts. It is theorised that the William Mencken that is most likely to be John's father was an army deserter sentenced to seven years hard labour. Unfortunately, things would not become easier on which William was which, as not only were there multiple William Menkens in Australia around the same time, but they all seemed to name one of their sons John, and all would go on to have multiple children. However, one William Mencken died on the 20th of January, 1887 from diarrhoea and debility. It was his granddaughter who was the informant of his death certificate, and she did not know the name of his father or the surname of his mother. But William's life wasn't just a conviction and death. He actually did really well for himself and built a middle-class life for his family by working hard and becoming a hotel owner. Ellen Bolton, John's mother, has a much clearer history starting with her conviction of sacrilege, which just means she stole a Bible and a prayer book from the Shenstone Church. But her life would be far from easy. Her father was executed for treason, her mother was sentenced to labour, and Ellen grew up in an orphanage, all leaving her with her own trauma. But collectively, William and Ellen Mencken both worked hard to provide a happy and stable life for their children. However, whether it is for the better or the worse, there is always a black sheep in the family, and in this family, it was John. Starting his career in crime, John pled guilty for sheep theft in February of 1864, where he was sentenced to six months of hard labour at the Parramatta Jail. John would be in and out of jail for various crimes that were sadly not recorded. He would, however, eventually appear in the insolvency court in 1870, where he would have to surrender all of his assets, coming to a total of two pounds. It really is a shame that there isn't many records before their crimes, as it is only plainly stated that John would meet and marry Sarah a year after his insolvency. What is quite strange with this situation is that Sarah used her married name, Edwards, even though she was listed as a spinster on her certificate, rather than a widower or a divorcee. And for that reason, it is theorised that she was a bigamist, which was relatively popular in the 1800s, given the frequency of desertion and difficulty of obtaining a divorce. A year after their marriage, Sarah would give birth to their first child, William Sutcliffe Mencken. Two years after, on their actual anniversary, Sarah gave birth to Blanche Ellen Gertrude Mencken. Sarah would become pregnant again, almost immediately after, as less than nine months later, she would give birth to a third child, Florence Eileen Elise Mencken. This meant that she would have three children all under the age of three, which I can only begin to imagine would have been difficult. But this would not stop Sarah and John as over the next 16 years, they would go on to have another seven children. In 1881, John was arrested again for stealing and butchering a lamb 
and was sentenced to three months prison. It is unknown how Sarah managed to survive while supporting all her children. You would think the responsibility of parenthood would cause John to be more cautious, but this was simply not the case, as he would be released only to commit more crimes and return to jail. On the 13th of November, 1883, Sarah's seventh child, Leslie Ronald Joseph Menken, died from convulsions caused by syphilis. The same would happen again just a year later as their daughter, Linda, would die at the same age of eight months old from the same thing. At this point, Sarah had not attended either funerals. It was in 1888 that a third child would die suddenly. Harold Campbell Menken, born just three months earlier, would die from infantile atrophy. As it was written by the doctors, Harold had failed to thrive, which is just another side effect of congenital syphilis. Now, you may be wondering how the heck can a baby contract syphilis? Honestly, while it's horrifying, it's relatively simple. Sarah herself would have had the disease and the babies would have contracted it while developing in the womb. It is theorized that Sarah may have contracted the disease from her first husband, Charles, who was a mariner. That is brought up as many sources like to point out that seamen tend to sail around and find sexual partners where they can. This would include on convict ships where seamen would engage sexually with the convicted women, where the disease would have spread from one person to another. Due to the deaths of these children, it is theorized that both John and Sarah may have become detached from their emotions surrounding death of children, leaving them effectively numb to the thought, which is just beyond me because the thought of something like that happening to a small child, I don't like to think about it because I'm emotional and I will cry. From Christmas of 1891, John no longer worked, leaving those nearby to wonder if he had become sick. As it is, he would also have been infected by Sarah. But as he didn't work, the family became completely reliant on Sarah working as a ladies nurse and an influx of mothers and babies that would have entered their life from about 1888 onwards. It was the 12th of February, 1892, when 19-year-old Agnes Ward, a domestic servant living in Cooks River, gave birth to a male child at the residence of Mrs. Elizabeth Terry, a midwife at Fleet Street, Summerhill. The birth was registered at Ashfield, with the child named Charles Ward. Agnes was not married and did not have wealth. So on the 27th of April, she paid an advertisement in an evening news for a kind lady to adopt her baby boy. The hope from Agnes was that this would provide her son with the best opportunities possible, knowing that she would not be able to provide. The next day, John and Sarah Menken and their daughter Daisy met with Agnes at Mrs. Terry's residence. They agreed to adopt the infant for a five pound fee and promised to be very kind to it. John appeared to be a convincing liar as he claimed he was taking the child to fill the gap caused by the death of his own child named Johnny. And this child would take the dead child's place. I don't think any child could ever take the place of your own deceased child. But as I love to add a disclaimer, I am not a parent, so I don't know. But I also don't think it would work that way anyway. I don't know. Leave me a comment, send me an email. John told Agnes that they were living in Kettle Street in Redfern but were shortly to move to take a piggery and promised to send their new address just in case Agnes wanted to visit her son. Clara Risby worked as a domestic servant in Woolloomooloo. However, her life was impacted when she gave birth to a baby girl on the 15th of April, 1892, at the Benevolent Asylum. On May 4th, she placed an advertiser in the evening news seeking a kind person to adopt a baby girl for life, offering a premium of five pounds. Much like many others who took to this option, it was in hope that her child would live a good life as she would not be able to provide that while working as a single mother without status. The Menkins sent her a letter using the false surname McLaughlin, showing their interest in adopting the baby girl. Clara and her married stepsister, Mary, took the baby to the Menkins' house on the 16th of May, where the baby was adopted. Sarah doted on the baby girl and said she would look after the child as if it was her own. And John chimed in, telling them he had money left to him and they were going to take a poultry farm in Rockdale. Clara's stepsister left her address with the couple who promised to let her know their new address. 
Clara visited and saw her daughter on the 18th of May. On her next visit, she was told that Mrs. McLaughlin, aka Sarah Menken, was out with the child. Clara attempted to visit a third time on the 24th of May, but to her horror, she found the house empty. It was around this time that the Menken family had hit a small snag in their operation. You see, the George Street address was being rented by them for 17 shillings per week, but had fallen behind on their rent. This caused their landlord to be a frequent visitor, following up what was owed. In the book, The Baby Farmers, a chilling tale of missing babies, shameful secrets, and murder in 19th century Australia by Annie Cossens, she alleges that the last time the landlord had called in, he caught the couple hiding and whispering to each other, all while he knocked on the door. However, a few days later, they managed to slip away by moving out in the dead of night without a word. But it wasn't just the landlord they were avoiding, but also the curiosity of the new mothers who had given them their babies and money. These poor mothers wouldn't know what had become of their babies for quite some time, let alone that the backyard of the George Street home had become an impromptu graveyard. The next house the Menkins lived in was 25 Byron Street. The next house the Menkins lived in was 25 Byron Street, McDonald Town, which was only one suburb over from their previous dwelling. This would be their last before being captured. It is believed that there were four more babies taken in by the Menken family before this move. This would include the daughter of a domestic servant by the name of Agnes Todd. She paid the Menkens a premium of three pounds and never saw her daughter again. 18-year-old Amber Murray adopted her son Horace to the Mankins for a premium of three pounds. Sadly, it may have been due to age or illiteracy, but Amber did witness something strange as she had the Mankins sign the adoption papers, something they were not accustomed to. John first signed as John Leslie, which he then scratched out and signed as Hill. That day was the last time Amber would see her son. Mary Stacy, a domestic servant, put her daughter up for adoption. This little girl would have been taken in for just two pounds. Mary Stacy would be the first to be brave enough to raise the alarm with the police, as she had been told the family would be moving to Hertzville. She believed them initially, but after attempting to visit her daughter, she had spent two days searching the suburb for her baby with no luck. Sadly for Mary Stacy, the Menken family had used false names, and she knew them as the Ray family. On the 10th of June, 1892, a domestic servant simply known as Minnie Davis gave birth to a baby girl. The child was named after her mother, and the birth was registered in Newtown with the father's details included. On the 21st of June, an advertisement on the 21st of June, an advertisement was placed in the Sydney Morning Herald for a kind person to adopt her child. The same as usual would ensue, except this would not be an outright adoption. Instead, Minnie would pay 10 shillings a week and was told the parents they could see the baby whenever they liked. Minnie and her partner would visit every Saturday to see the baby and pay the weekly fee. It was during one of the visits the couples discovered the Menken's real surname when they saw a printed card reading, Mrs. Menken, ladies, nurse, and qualified midwife. It was directly after this when Sarah admitted to deceiving them. On the 23rd of July, Minnie was informed that her daughter had a cold, which escalated the following Saturday to the child being very ill. Sarah had soothed Minnie by telling her that she would take the baby to see the doctor on Monday. Sadly, a few days later, Minnie and her partner received a telegram saying that the child had died. The parents arrived on the Thursday to grieve and bid farewell to their daughter. It was effectively a poor man's wake. The deceased child was laid out on a board, enshrouded in a long white gown. John had said to Minnie, perhaps it's better that it did die. Which if I was Minnie or her partner, I would have gone down for murder on that statement because that baby was not failing to thrive until it arrived at the Menken's. But they more just asked what the cause of death was, hoping to find some solace and understanding on what happened. Sarah, the monster, joined in and told them, It wasted away. I will have no bother in getting a certificate from the doctor. 
John chimed in, claiming the coffin had been ordered and he would bury the infant for two pounds. Like, I suppose that in itself would be a little package deal, but because I know the truth of the matter, it actually makes me more than a little angry. Swindling this poor, grieving couple for more money after murdering their baby. That being said, it wouldn't be long until the truth was found out. You see, the Menkins had been particularly careless in their operations. On the 16th of August, they had left their home in Burham Street, where the landlord, Mr. Mulvey, attempted to find new tenants with little to no success, due to everyone complaining of a horrible stench. Honestly, between this and Frederick Deeming, it... I wonder how many places had a horrible stench which made it impossible for them to rent out. You have to admit, it's a little strange, right? <laughs> Wanting to do the right thing, the landlord hired two men to lay new drainage pipes, assuming that was the issue. The two men started the process of digging a trench in the morning of the 11th of October, and it wouldn't be long until one of the labourers dug up a small bundle that was buried only six inches underground. Now, it wasn't initially believed to be anything sinister. In fact, the labourer believed it was a cat that had passed away and reburied it to the side of the trench he was digging. The next day, the second labourer found a second bundle, just a metre away from the first, and found this to be more than just a little suspicious, and decided to investigate what the bundle was. This poor man opened the bundle to find decomposing remains of a baby. Both men then hurried to Newtown Police Station to advise of their discovery. Senior Constable James Joyce and Constable Alexander Brown arrived at 25 Burren Street in a horse-drawn police van, where they found not just the one, but two decomposing babies. The bodies were delivered to the South Sydney morgue. Taking their next steps, police spoke with the neighbours for information on the previous tenants. Elizabeth Hill was surprised when Constable Joyce knocked on her door but gladly told him everything she knew, which was later recounted by her neighbour, Mrs. Parry, who was quoted saying, I've never been so surprised in all my life when the constable stood on my doorstep and announced two dead babies had been dug up in Mr. Mulvey's backyard. They wanted to know if Mr. Mulvey and his wife had any children. I assured them that the babies could not belong to them. Likely not, I said. It must be the Menkins because she called herself a midwife and a ladies' nurse. Mind you, I only ever saw them with one baby, about three months old, but it wasn't theirs. Mrs. Menken was nursing it for a young couple I saw two times when they visited. They seemed decent enough pair, neatly dressed. One time when I asked about the baby, Mrs. Menken told me the young couple had taken it away. At any rate, I didn't see any other babies, although they left in a bit of a hurry in August. At this, the constables became quite excited, though, I couldn't tell them where the Menkins had gone. This is where the larger of the mistakes had taken hold for Sarah and John. Not only had they become used to the smell of decomposition, but they had used their real surnames when renting 25 Barron Street. The constables were excited because getting a conviction on such a grim crime was near impossible. The few that had previously been reported to the authorities were let go due to insufficient evidence. But this time, they had more than enough to move forward. The Menkins were tracked down and arrested. It was in that same year that the Children's Protection Act was passed, making it illegal to not register the birth or adoption of a baby. Not that this would entirely prevent women from failing to do so, as this would not bring in any support to the mothers, only further scrutiny. However, it was due to this new act, the coroner had to investigate suspicious deaths of children, including the two babies found in Burren Street. On the 2nd of November, Senior Constable James Joyce and Constable Alexander Brown commenced digging in the yard of Burren Street, where they found an additional five babies' bodies. This triggered John Menken and his daughters to be arrested on the 3rd of November. Sarah Menken was already at the station, having been arrested at Parramatta. During the questioning, Blanche disclosed that her mother had three infants to care for at one time. John and Sarah Menken were charged on suspicion with causing the death of an illegitimate female child, the offspring of Horace and Minnie, on or about the end of July 
or the beginning of August. The daughters Blanche and Florence Menken were also charged on suspicion of being concerned in the death of the child in question. It was from this point that the police announced their intention to investigate the yards of the houses the family had occupied during the past three or four years, as it was the question that the Menkens had been engaged in baby farming. This would be confirmed as the bodies of 15 infants had been found in the yards of the homes that the Menkens had lived in. 25 Byron Street had only been occupied for just two months and the bodies of seven infants were recovered from the yard. The first infant was male, aged from five to eight months, buried from three to six months. The second was a female infant, stillborn. The third was a male infant, aged from two or three months, buried from four to six months. The fourth was determined by the inquest jury to be the female child of Minnie Davis and Horace. And the fifth was a female infant, estimated to be 10 days old, buried for roughly three months. It was at the inquest into the bodies found at Byron Street at the coroner's court that Clarice Menken gave evidence that the family's relocation from George Street to Byron Street was carried out between 7 and 8 o'clock at night, taking with them six babies, two in a cradle, two in a stroller, one carried by her mother and another carried by Daisy. However, at the trial of her parents on the 6th of March, 1893, Clarice claimed to have no recollection of saying that she saw six babies being taken to Byron Street when the family moved there. The house at Zemia Street resulted in locating one body being found. Next on the list was the house at George Street where four infants' bodies. The body marked D was later identified as Horace Amber Murray, for whose murder the Menken was later charged. It was also speculated that the body marked C was provisionally determined to be Agnes Ward's son. The next infant was found at 11 Alderson Street, buried two feet deep, wrapped in black cloth and estimated age was between two to six weeks. The time since burial was estimated from six to 12 months and the gender was listed as impossible to ascertain. And finally, the house on Levy Street brought up the remains of two infants in the yard near the kitchen wall. The infants were buried together, but not much else could be confirmed as little remained but bones. From this came inquests into the attempt to identify the infants and what caused their deaths. This even went as far as to publish the sexes of the infants as well as what clothing they were buried with as to ask the public for any insights that could help shed light on who they belonged to. At one point, after the jury was sworn in, the inquest visited South Sydney Morgue to view the bodies of the infants. It was whilst there that the female prisoners became greatly affected, crying crocodile tears. Starting the 6th of March, 1893, John and Sarah Menken were put on trial at the Central Criminal Court. They were charged with having feloniously and maliciously murdered Horace Amber Murray. They were also charged with having murdered a certain male infant whose name is unknown on or around the same time at the same place. The Menkins pleaded not guilty to the charges and were defended by Tolmus Williamson. The jury had been sworn in and the trial formally began. Sarah and John were brought up from the cells below and John made himself comfortable by crossing his arms and legs, sitting in the dock during the Crown Prosecutor's address and the witnesses' evidence. John put on a front of confidence through his body language, refusing to show any shame, unlike Sarah, who hid her face with a handkerchief throughout the day. Witnesses included Amber Murray, who detailed a sequence of events leading to her handing over her infant to the Menkins. She identified the clothes found on the remains of the child as those that her son was wearing when he was handed over. On the second day of the trial, Edward Jordan, a horse trainer who was locked up in Newton Police Station with John Menken, gave evidence. During the confinement, he alleged that John told him that seven babies had been found, but there was an eighth not yet discovered. John allegedly added that when the eighth was found, he would never see daylight ever again, and that was what a man got for obliging people. Edward also claimed that Menken told him no doctor could prove that he had poisoned any of them because he never went near a chemist. What an actual scumbag. 
The issue the prosecution was facing in this case was proving that it was actual murder without any evidence. Dear listener, you may be thinking the same as me and wondering how them being buried in their backyard isn't evidence enough. Well, that is because that was a practice some would participate in, as they did not have the funds to bury their loved ones in a cemetery. Now on top of that, the bodies were in such a state of decay, and forensic testing was in its infancy, so there was no way to prove how the babies had died. This meant that there was insufficient evidence for Amber Murray and the four other unmarried mothers. However, what would act as evidence in this situation was Amber's midwife and Edward Jordan as a prison informant. The Menkins were taking exceedingly low premiums, only taking between two to five pounds to adopt a baby for life. This would not have been nearly enough to help feed and clothe the babies they took in, thus giving way to proposed motive to kill the babies so they could keep the small amount of money without having to spend any further. This brought in with how the Menkins would lie consistently to the mothers of these babies, including how they moved to Hurstville, how Amber had been shown a different sickly baby covered in sores, and the concealment of the unnatural death of Horace. Sadly, this was all only circumstantial evidence. They had no eyewitnesses to call up, or at least none that were willing to talk. But the prosecution was not going to go down without a fight and called Constable Joyce to give evidence on the 12 other deceased babies found in the yards of the houses that the Menkins had lived in. Constable Joyce was the first witness on the stand, and as the days would go by, the Menkins would watch the parade of mothers give evidence about their baby farming activities. Clara Risby also went on the witness box, followed by Mary Stacy and Agnes Todd, showing that the Menkins had been extremely busy during the month of June, taking on so many babies as they could before promptly disposing of them like they were nothing. Each mother sobbed as they recounted parting with their children. They had been lied to, and now their babies were dead rather than living a better life that they had been promised. Then came Mrs. Hill, briefly the neighbour of the Menkins, giving evidence on the suspicious activities that she would witness where John would be in the yard with picks and shovels, which was then followed by Edward Jordan, claiming that John admitted to burying babies in the yard of Burren and George Street, and almost as a final nail in the proverbial coffin for the Menkins. On day three, the defence did not call any witnesses to the stand, nor did John or Sarah explain their own version of events. The defence even tried to use technicalities to debunk what evidence had been gathered, including that he believed baby Horace had not been clearly identified and that the cause of his death could not be proved. Finally, Justice Stephen turned to the jury and advised them that the Menken's failure to give evidence should not be used against them because the law allowed them their right to silence. The jury retired at 5 p.m. and returned to the court at 10 a.m. the next morning. The foreman stated that they had agreed to a verdict of guilty for the murder of Horace Murray in the respect of both prisoners. The foreman added that they strongly recommended mercy for Sarah Menken. Justice Stevens said he would defer passing sentence pending determination by the Supreme Court on points regarding admissibility of certain evidence at trial. It was greatly debated and eventually agreed upon that the Menkins did not receive a fair trial, and in certain publication it was boldly claimed that justice had been administered in the dark. That being said, it was also stated in other publications, specifically other newspapers, that while the hangman's noose was one of the worst ways to go, no one deserved it more than the Menken family. The appeal against the conviction was heard on the 23rd of March before a full bench of the Supreme Court, which was made up of Justice Windia, Justice Enos, and Justice Foster's. The Queen's counsel, Sir Julian Solomons, led in support of the appeal, with Francis Rogers, Queen's counsel, heading the team in the support of conviction. The grounds for the appeal were as follows. 1. Justice Stephen was wrong in admitting evidence of other bodies aside from the bodies of the alleged children to be Horace Murray. 2. The judge was wrong admitting the evidence of mothers apart from Amber Murray who had given up her children to the Menkins. 
three, that there was no evidence to prove the body marked D was that of Horace Murray. Four, and finally, that there was no evidence of the death or cause of death of Horace Murray, or that he had been murdered. After arguments had been made and heard out in full, the bench advised they would consider their decision. This would take roughly a week, and on the 30th of March, it was finally delivered, and the appeal had been dismissed, confirming the convictions. The main judgment was 27 pages in length, but to give the short of it, Justice Windia agreed with the conviction and was supported by Justice Foster. Justice Enos disagreed with how the evidence was presented and that the other evidence should not have been included. However, he agreed with his fellow judges that the convictions against the Menkins should stand. Think about that for a second. You have a Supreme Court judge agree with you that things weren't done correctly, but then turns around and says that you should still hang for it. It's almost like taking a math test where your calculations are wrong, but still somehow you get the right answer. On the same day of the appeal dismissal, John and Sarah Menken appeared and were sentenced in the criminal court by Justice Stephen. John Menken stood up on the dock giving full attitude while Sarah Menken was assisted into her place and hid her face with a handkerchief. When Justice Stephen asked if there was anything they had to say as to why the sentence should not be passed, John replied defiantly saying, I have only got to say that we are innocent for the sake of our children. Justice Stephen, whose voice was described as serious and stern, was quoted as saying, You stand before me convicted of the murder, which was accompanied by almost every incident that could possibly add to its wickedness. You took money from the mother of Horace. You beguiled her with promises, which you never meant to perform. Having already determined the death of the child, you misled her by false statements as to your name. You deceived her as to your address. Finally, in order to render your detection impossible, you buried the child in the yard as you would the carcass of a dog. You were engaged in baby farming in its most hideous and revolting aspect. Three yards of houses in which you lived testified with ghastly evidence that you were carrying on this nefarious and hellish trade, destroying the lives of those infants for the sake of gain. These young women who testified against you called upon you. Each of them cry, where is my child? To that cry you have never given an answer and do not even now. Who, then, can doubt that the children met with their deaths in one way or by other criminal conduct on your part? And for what? For a paltry sum of five pounds or three pounds or two. Sums you can count as nothing against the lives of sufferings. And God knows the sufferings of these poor babies. Surely, two people stand before me whose hearts must be hard as adamant, utterly indifferent to human suffering, and whom in conscience must be utterly dead. I only hope that in the time that remain to you, your hearts will be softened, and you'll endeavour to find mercy at the hands of him who gave you lives you have taken away. I do trust you will remember thirteen children, I am not unjust in referring to them. I only hope and trust that though you have given no account of them, the community calls upon you and you must account to God. Nothing remains for me but to pass the sentence of death upon you. The sentence of the court upon you, John Menken, is that you would be taken to the place of execution and there you be hanged by the neck until your body is dead. Justice Stephen then turned his attention directly to Sarah Menken and was quoted as saying, In your case, of course, I shall call for the execution recommendation to mercy, where it will receive consideration. But the effect of consideration I am not able to say, and may God have mercy on your souls. The Menkins attempted to appeal their sentencing, but it was dismissed once again, leaving them to their fates. But not one, but not one to give up. John Menken attempted to start a petition, which was signed by a few Wollongong citizens, to save his worthless life. However, the executive council, as expected, was unconvinced by the petition to save John's life, and decided the law should take its course. John Menken was executed by hanging just after 9am on Tuesday the 15th of August 1893 at the Darlinghurst Jail. Five days prior to her husband's execution, 
Sarah Menken was transferred from Darlinghurst Jail to Bathurst Jail. And in May of 1895, she was transferred back to Darlinghurst Jail and then returned to Bathurst Jail in November of 1898. During her second stay at Bathurst, she was given a job as hospital attendant at the jail. However, her health deteriorated during her incarceration, occasionally suffering from intestinal hemorrhages. Suffice to say, she deserved it. By 1907, two of Sarah's daughters, Florence and Minnie, had ample concerns for their mother's health and both wrote to the Attorney General requesting release from prison. Ultimately, their requests had been refused. Sarah continued to move from prison to prison and in 1911, a new Attorney General took position in office, prompting Sarah's daughters to start another campaign for her release so that she can spend her last days with her family. This time, after considering her advanced age and declining health, the Attorney General recommended her release, and Sarah Menken was discharged quietly and anonymously from Long Bay Jail on the 29th of April 1911 into the care of her daughter Florence and her husband. Sarah Menken died on the 13th of September 1918, aged 72 years, from senile decay and heart failure, which was possibly due to syphilis. She was buried in the Rockwood Cemetery. I don't know why they released her, She ended up with seven years on the outside with her family. Those babies didn't even get more than a few days. So, personal opinion, she should have been left to rot in a cell. But on that note, that is all I have for you this week. I will be posting relevant images on Facebook and Instagram at What You Should Know Australia. If you wish to reach out to me, or you would like to find out how you can help support the podcast, you can do so by sending me an email at whiskerpod at gmail.com that is w-y-s-k-a-p-o-d at gmail.com if you haven't already draw a moustache on the five star review button you know you want to but until next time stay safe and stay hydrated bye